try drishti is yeah i'll i'll change it okay make a co-host then yes we're also live That's a very nice watch. I've never seen that watch. I bought it on the street. Guess how much? My favorite. My favorite response to "I like what you're wearing" is guess mm -hmm. how much? How much? Uh, five hundred, two hundred, six hundred, thousand, hundred and fifty. One fifty. From where? From the street. I bought it. <laughs> and that guy is telling me it's not sasta because chori ka mal hai. I don't know if he was telling the truth or not, but. <laughs> They have school. It has a hexagonal face. Yeah, it's not only. Okay, I'm going to start. Uh, Dishti, we are live, no? Yes, yes, we are live. Uh, welcome everybody to day two of Meta twenty twenty four. This is our twelfth edition of Meta, and uh, as is as it's become customary now to have a Paro Devi special at our Metas in the last five years. I'm very, very, very happy to uh, have on board with us. writer filmmaker and bombastic lady farumita ora whose work has um, quite literally changed my life i um i started working 10 years ago and i discovered farumita's work uh, i think 3 or 4 years into my job and i must say the kind of um, lightness she brought to how i see the world how i see the classroom how i see relationships and people have changed immensely over the last ever since i've discovered her it hasn't been the same there are very few people who can do that and that uh, we often have this joke that she is the shahrukh khan inside many people's lives and uh, i can talk about parumita ora for hours and hours like i do in all my classes uh, but today is not about me or my love for parumita ora it's about parumita ora so uh, i am going to tell you what we are going to talk about and then it will just be paro 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 uh i think a uh, year or two ago i realized that and it's a very shitty kind of realization that uh, uh, the world is changing it's a very stupid thing to say because the world is always changing and i don't want to also i think i want to sound like a very old auntie today i think for the purposes of this event i will be an auntie because i have uh, uh i think the world has changed a lot and i'm just going to say it and working has changed and it hasn't changed because uh, i have become lazier or unwilling it has also changed because what becomes too much work what becomes less work what becomes unwilling is today apparently decided by young people and uh, i am trying to figure out where this is coming from uh, and i noticed that even parumita who has founded agents of fish uh, which celebrated its 10 year old anniversary earlier this year 10 year old not yet 10 it's 8 i don't know sorry 8 8 year old anniversary earlier this year uh she has founded it she's been running it and she also has to deal with uh the the burden of carrying something forward that you have started um i have seen closely the work of also dr abulmani who i keep finding similarities between parumita ora's work and dr abulmani's work even though they are in completely different fields uh the idea of starting something and then getting people to follow it um building something with your hands and then watching people come and do things with it uh, and how difficult it is to sustain work in a world that is increasingly demanding people to switch off to do self care to say no to things that challenge you so primarily my question to you to uh, to start off the theme uh, to we are here today to ask parumita ora about how her relationship with work has changed over the years Uh, after extensive stalking and uh, many many other things we found out that she has she started working very young she moved to bombay city and that i'll allow her to tell her tell the rest of the story herself i don't want to speak for her but here ma'am we are here for you we are all ears we want to know what it was like to start working when you were young how it was then how it is now uh, what were your moments of great love what were your moments of great irritation everything So thank you very much for having me here. You know, every year I have that anxiety 
when I see the posts about Meta and I'm like, will they call me this year or not call me this year? Like, you know, eventually everybody ceases to be a beloved flavor and you, everybody wants something new. So I'm like, will this be the year that I become the old one? So I'm very happy to be here. Maybe it's the last one, maybe it's not, but uh, I intend to enjoy it every bit. Um, and I also just want to say thank you for the kind of festival that it is, because I think, <clears throat> and I say this not just out of politeness, but uh, it's intertwined with some of the things that we are speaking about that, you know, to build something that um, is for other people to engage with. It's not like some altruistic act. I think it's like we kind of want to build a world that we want to belong in. And it's quite hard to um, create something and run it year after year, as you guys have been doing, and do it with a sense of Shwadaviv and uh, sincerity and not, you know, falling into the traps of uh, typical institutional ideas that now we want bigger names and better names. And which is, I see that like a uh, very often young people from colleges do write saying we're having a festival, we're having an event. And you can see the difference between uh, colleges where the festival is a kind of way of learning about how to be in the real world, uh, sponsorship and, uh, people asking you to do things, but without really knowing anything much about you, that approximate idea that you have something to do with gender and something to do with sex and something to do with, yeah, something Bollywood. And, you know, uh, many people like think I'm a journalist. It's that big, it's not even Googled uh, before calling you. So the lack of love and how replaceable everybody is uh, in the scheme of things actually creates a very, it's, it's a kind of atomization uh, that really missing and thankfully is not present in Meta. I mean, I simply loved that overheard at Meta Twitter account because it sort of added to the, like, you know, added to the spiciness and the funness. And I mean, obviously something in Bangalore waters, in Joseph's water, I don't know. But like people have this very exuberant and extravagant way of expressing themselves, which is like utterly tasty. So yeah, all of this to say that it's really great to be here and Great to talk about work, you know. I, I mean, most of my life is just work. So you could, so often we do say that, right? Like, oh, I have no life. I'm always working. But I also feel that's a terrible thing to say because it's quite, I mean, I really do like my work even when I'm feeling frustrated with it and I hate it and I hate myself and I hate everybody. But in essence, I really love to work and I love the work that I get to do most of the time. So I don't, I mean, I think it is, it is very intertwined with my life. You know? <clears throat> so what was it like to start working? You know, I started working uh, just pre-liberalization. Mm -hmm. And I think when you say the world has changed, that, that does mark a change. Um, I mean, in 1989, so I have this, uh, I had a teacher when I was in college in Miranda House uh, called Zakia Pathak. And Zakia Pathak, like most of us had like a big crush on her. Yes, the earrings. Mm -hmm. yeah, the earrings. So, and Zakia Patek taught us like uh, classics paper and I study literature. So she taught us Greek classics and whatever. And she had a very soft and husky voice and very clipped way of talking. And she was didn't take silliness very well. Like you were not allowed to be foolish. She didn't encourage it. Actually, most of our teachers didn't. So there was this kind of a thing also, I think, that with the teachers we had in my college, there was, it was a girl's college. And I think that was kind of a nice thing because if I look back and I think what being in a girl's college taught me and it taught me to take other women seriously. But I think when you're in co-ed, there is a way in which uh, like the general gendering of the world and the fact that gents are supposed to be the ones who know stuff and girls are kind of like, oh, I didn't really know that. And, you know, a little timid. I mean, I think it is something we all negotiate as we go through life. But since that was not there, as an ongoing thing, you basically were engaged with other women in your class and you were learning to just uh, in, uh, take interest in what they said. You're in tutorials with them you're, and your teachers are women and they are telling you things and and they're telling you awesome things, actually. But our teachers were fantastic. And so an entire world of poetry and feminism and thinking was opening out. And, you know, even back then, I remember, I mean, Delhi University, not exactly the world's most like welcoming libraries or you know it was very like the stacks were very musty and there were very few books like most of the books in the library were successfully books that were not worth borrowing mm -hmm. and uh, the books that you were supposed to borrow like they were so hard to get and you're always kind of chasing those books but our teachers had created this cupboard in the English department which was a separate library of the English department <laughs> but they had 
fired books, which were not easy to get, which the college wouldn't order and which we had to borrow in the way that you borrow from libraries. And now when I look back, I think what an act of love, right? Like look at the way in which they did their work as teachers at a time when this entire space of going abroad to study and South Asian academia and all of that wasn't really there. Like the rewards that are now present for academia weren't mm. present in those days. I mean, there were teachers, there were teachers in college. Manju Kapoor was my teacher. I mean, Mrs. Dalmia. So like, it was very, it's cool when you look back and think like, oh, later on, that's what all these people did. Or Rajeshwari Sundarajan was my teacher. So they went on to do all these amazing things. That time they seemed very old to us. That's the other thing. Mm. Now, when I look back, I think like they must have been 40 or something. And yes, they went or 30 something. <laughs> they went on to do amazing things. So, I mean, I think Zakia <clears> Patak <throat> one day, so I was a very like uh, awkward young person and very shy and uh, didn't really have too many friends and stuff like that. But I really liked college. Like when I went to college, I, in school, I always felt ill at ease. I didn't feel I belonged. I was doing pretty badly at some subjects and you know, like kind of struggling along in my own way. But then college was a place where I felt comfortable. And when I look back, yeah, I really loved studying literature. But I think what I loved most of all was the chance to be able to think and having your ideas taken seriously and a tremendous space for political and intellectual engagement mm -hmm. and also fun. It was not that it was so dreary or anything. I mean, we obviously thought that that one rupee sambar in the canteen was the best thing and you know we save up our money to go and so all of that was there um <clears throat> but I think um in my so I studied quite a bit because I had no like social life mm -hmm. and then I did very well in my exams which is not a very common occurrence in my life until then so I became a little bit famous in the college because the college had not had a first division for many years and then suddenly I got one so they were like oh <laughs> you know uh I was like winning big boss I guess <laughs> so <laughs> When I went to college, I became a little more confident also because of that. So I started making a few friends. And then I began to do some slightly normal things that young people do. And it was really one of the first times in my life that I was having that kind of a limited social life. Mm -hmm. um, so I got into it. And by the time I was in third year, my grades started doing not so great. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Patak met me in the corridor and she said, Paramita, what are you planning to do after college? I'm like, I don't know, ma'am. Maybe I'll do my MA. She was like, that's terrible. So I got a shock because I thought that surely she would be happy that I want to do my MA. She said, you know, there's a lot of things you can do in the world. You should go out into the world and you should see if there's something you like to do. And then if you don't like any of the things, you can always come back into academia. But I think that you should take your studies a bit seriously. You should take your career a bit seriously because it's nice to be popular, but not at the cost of your work. Mm -hmm. I was a very obedient character. I immediately became... I was chastised. I was sobered. I became a little more serious. But the fact is that I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, all of it is to say. But I feel like this imperative that the teachers are not telling you uh, or like, I'm taking what Mrs. Patak says so seriously because she has impacted me at some soul level, right? Like she has made me feel a stirring of what it is that I like. She showed me that she's opened that door. So I trust her. And when she tells me something, I didn't believe that she's being a witch and why is she what is her problem and why is she saying this to me I didn't think all that I, I took it totally at face value and I was right to take it at face value because she did care she did care that I should do something that she felt would suit me and I would be good at it that I would do well in the world right so but the thing is that after college I was just like oh what should I do then I with mass communication the mass communication it was like a, it's not a committed thing right like it has some many subjects and it's a sufficiently vague course <laughs> and it sounds a little new and when your dad is asking you what are you going to do I'm like I'm doing mass communication and my dad is like what is that thing what do you do afterwards and, and you know and I got rejected from Jamia which at that time I cried a lot but uh, I think was one of the best things that happened to me um Anyway, I came to Bombay to study in Sophia College. I lied to my father and said that oh, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to advertising. People make a lot of money in advertising. But I obviously didn't do any such thing. Um, I did work in an ad film for one week, but it's a different story. And essentially, right out of right out of Sophia, so I would have been 21, 20 or 21, I don't remember. I started, I had an internship uh, with the documentary filmmaker Anand Patwarzan. And then I was really lucky to get such a nice internship. I had wanted it and I got it. Um, and that year also, Bombay had its first documentary film festival. So we've got one week chutti from college to go and attend the film festival because it never happened before. 
and then I was so serious and it was very very cold a lot of the AC was very cold in that auditorium so I used to go with one full blanket from nine in the morning to nine at night just watch everything so like the most my most uh the most memorable uh, I won't say film, but memorable activity of mine was that I even watched a film on mud architecture in the French Cameroons in French without subtitles. But I was like, no, I must, <laughs> I must somehow the Swedish be the light. I think, uh, I mean, I think that when you don't have a lot of options ahead of, in front of you, right? Like, it's not like I was going to become a CA or do my MBA or go into the IS. I knew I didn't want to do all those things. I didn't think I, I don't think I ever felt I belonged anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So I was scared. So I think I just naturally went towards things which didn't seem to have too many predetermined rules. Mm -hmm. And documentary film was like that, right? In in the festival, what I saw is that there are really done as many types of films as there are people. Mm -hmm. there films that were very straightforward social documentaries. There were films that were, you know, nationalist films division documentaries there were funny films there were poetic films there were completely abstract films and anthropo- like, there was all kinds of things what kinds of films were you immediately attracted to sorry what kind was it so i remember seeing uh, i remember seeing uh india 67 by sukhdev which you can see on youtube oh. and i have never seen anything like that actually mm-hmm. it was just like a one hour film which is a kind of montage of images from all over india and you know, just all this kind of interesting soundtrack. So that excited me a lot. Um, I remember seeing a film about the writer Bashir. I don't remember the name of the film, but that also that you can come to know the texture of somebody from watching the film in this way. And then I saw a film by John Comfra called Twilight City, which had this very kind of uh, poetic, uh, abstract kind of voiceover. And I didn't know that you can actually do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What it seemed to do was... It combined all the things I loved. It combined poetry, it combined reality, it combined thinking about the world, films. And actually it was like, whatever I had learned in literature, in a sense, I felt that it was expanding all Mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Um, Plus I would say that it was a vibrant world. Like there were a lot of filmmakers who came from all over the world. Of course, we were like very Chutu Batani. We did not dare to be speaking about <laughs> everything I was still in college. But the thing is, you you know, they did seem to represent mm-hmm. the idea that, and it may be naive, you know. I mean, of course, you are naive and that's great because you're idealistic when you're that age. Yeah. And now you may be more cynical or may roll your eyes at certain things. But I feel it's important to have that idealistic naivete and feel like, oh, wow, uh, look at the person who's like this, look at the way he spoke about his film and feeling that this is a group of people who are not so keen to fit in <clears throat> or who are not doing typical predictable things. That also was kind of important. So I think like for that reason, I was attracted to documentary. I asked if my internship could be in documentary. I was allowed to go and work with Anand. So that was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, as an intern at Anand's, I was like very, very extra hardworking. Mm-hmm. And I think nobody had ever worked so hard in that household. Like he's still working on the One day he came out, he said, you're still here? I said, yes, Mr. Padwarthan, you didn't tell me to leave yet. <laughs> <laughs> First, don't call me Mr. Padwarthan. <laughs> I was like, I would work, work, work. And I liked it. I felt excited to be close to real work. One I, second. You were living alone at this point? When no, you were I was living with my aunt. Okay. And mm-hmm. how did that work out? Like, what would you say at home and... Uh, so, you know, the thing is that when I decided I want to work in documentary, it was not exactly met with hurrahs and encouragement. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did for a while consider that I should go to film school, but there really wasn't too much eagerness. Uh, so my mother's family was in the movies, but like proper Bollywood, mm-hmm. right? And again, in those days, proper Bollywood came with all its ups and downs, highs and lows, too much drinking, too many love affairs, too much drama. Mm-hmm respectability so my dad didn't like adore the idea Mm -hmm. that I was like slowly inching my way to towards that world right and so sometimes I think that did I choose documentary just to keep everybody happy like Mm -hmm. to be in film but not like that kind of a way who knows Uh, I think so many things shape the choices that we make you know and and I don't think that's a bad thing I mean you lead the life you lead like big deal so when my dad was like I don't want you to go to film school because it's full of riffraff (laughs) Mm-hmm. He said, I'll go on mochas and you know the way that middle class people feel I was pretty mad at him and I you know of course had a fight with him for saying that like 
the way young people have theoretical fights with their family that you should not say or use terms like that for people and all that. But then I also felt this feeling like, you know, how long should my dad keep paying for my education? Because he paid for me to come study in Bombay. Bombay is not a cheap city, even though, yes, I was walking to the bus stop and saving money as much as I could. But my dad was in the Air Force. We didn't grow up with a lot of cash. So there was a sense that we don't have money and I can't endlessly ask my parents for so. And I didn't, I had that kind of a feeling that if you don't absolutely love what I'm doing and support it, then I don't want anything. So there was a kind of little cutter streak in me also. So I just started working. Then I was in documentary. So even my teachers from uh, mass media school uh, were like, what is this? Are you a pinko leftist? <laughs> Are you a pink or leftist? <laughs> How are you going to live? You should not, you know, people would say all of these things. And later on, many of my friends were like, we are so disappointed. You were such a promising person. <laughs> you are so bright. Why are you doing this? So yeah, generally there was a lot of doom and despair about my wanting to work in documentary. Mm -hmm. And my aunt, the first day when I came home from work around like 8.30 or 9, like late, she said, tell your boss that my aunt doesn't want me to come home late. So I said, well, I think if I tell my boss that he will sack me. So <laughs> I am going to be coming home late. So she was like, she, uh, my aunt was very Punjabi in a very typical Punjabi way. She said, ah, to si to meri because basically like you, you people only back answer. You'll have no respect. <laughs> <laughs> that thing that fighting, fighting with your family, not just your parents, but fighting with your family and doing what you wanted to do. And then, of course, telling little bit lies and saying that we had to work too late. But mostly if you got asked to do something grown up, like, you know, okay, we have finished, we've gone for shooting and we've come back from the shoot and then everybody be like, well, let's have a drink. At 21 and all, it's not like I was let's having a drink here and let's having a drink there. Like it was not a thing in my life. But it's cool to act grown up and it's nice to be with the grown ups. So then I would be like, okay, okay. Then I would go home late. And I remember this thing that my cousin said once to my father mm -hmm. complaining about me. That she comes home late in a taxi on her own with her arm across the back seat like a man. So this Wow. <laughs> this idea was not uh, I won't say that I was being all the time berated or something but it didn't feel comfortable even to people in my family who were themselves quite extreme not that they were some demure kind of people but there was an unease about being so so I think I found it tough I was grateful to them for giving me a place to stay but I also felt like too much scrutiny, too much being told what to do and having to fight about it. And I just want to be like without that scrutiny. So then I started like mounting a campaign that I want to shift out and live on my own. I had very little money. I wasn't earning all that much as a documentary. Internship was not paying you. Internship, I got a job and all that. No, I had a job, but I got a job with Anand, but then there was not much work. Mm -hmm. After a few weeks, I said, I don't have anything much to do, so I'm feeling bored. During the internship, there was a lot of work. We were continuously working. And another thing that happened while working with Anand was that, you know, it's one is that he has a way of working where he does everything himself. Mm -hmm. So he had his own editing machine. He would shoot his own films. And we are talking 16 millimeter, which was not that easy for people to have the means at that. Mm -hmm. In a sense, I also got exposed to a way of working, which was very hands-on, you know, mm -hmm. which was not like what I call Bhayaji, Bhayaji Cable Dena. School of <laughs> filmmaking. <laughs> Somebody gives you the cable and there's an attendance. Like there was it was just like some days I'm gonna say, okay, we have to go shoot, and then I'm carrying the tripod, and there were a lot of everybody knew me, that girl who's following after Anand with the mini bags. <laughs> so, you know, I was a comedic character in that way, but I was quite like enthu. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you learned a lot in that way. But I think the other thing which happened, which is really I think was huge exposure for me. Just getting exposed to an entire world of people in political activism and in the arts, right? All kinds of people. And there was a universe where people who are in theater, people who are working in independent film, people who are artists, people who are in the labor movement, people who are actually workers, mm -hmm. of course, the left movements. There was a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, a kind of... Uh, mixing of these worlds in a way that you don't see anymore. So I would say that there was Bollywood, there was television, and then there was everything else.
So everything else was, you know, even advertising and even NFDC type of films and then documentaries, theater, whatever, whatever. So it was pretty exciting. Like sometimes the doorbell would ring, I would open the door. Like supposing it was a movie, it would be like Ting Tong, open Nasiruddin Shah. <laughs> Mohan Gokhale. Like our people who are listening probably don't know who Mohan Gokhale was, but he was an actor. He acted in this film called, shit. Uh, it's Ketan Mehta's film where he has to get a series, television series. I'm forgetting the name, I'll remember it. But anyway, he was a well-known actor at that time. So, you know, that was exciting, obviously. Like, one day you come to work, Meera Nair is there. <laughs> when you come to work, Madhu is there. <laughs> the other thing was that I used to get sent out to do some work in the studio. <laughs> but at that time, you did some things for yourself at home, but a lot of processes you had to do in the lab, <laughs> in the studio. So first of all, first of all, I uh, told Lanan that I'm leaving the job because mm. there's not enough work for me. Mm. And doing internship, you were sending me here and there and making me do so many transcriptions. And I used to love doing transcriptions. Mm. I think I was the world's only assistant who loved doing transcriptions. Why? Why did you like it? Because you, uh, because in the transcriptions, you would get to know the things that have been shot and you could mm. see the whole thing, right? Like you were listening to the recording of what had been shot. So that's how you actually get to know the film because you're getting to know the footage as you record it. And plus, I had to translate it. So mm. I was very good at it. Like, I would listen to the Hindi and translate into English right away. And I would write by hand. In fact, I became so enthusiastic about transcription that, that I even bought some colored paper from my college shop and covered all the notebooks with some green paper and arranged them on the window. <laughs> I was like a full... Uh, it was like... Uh, work was like my... Uh, Barbie dollhouse, right? <laughs> so I had created that kind of a thing. <laughs> Yeah, but it was, I mean, also, it was nice to be in a space that was also not so formal, right? Which allowed you to be a little bit of a kid. Mm. That was also this thing that, you know, you, so I'll get, I, I, for a while I worked with this other film. So I told Anand that I'll come on the weekend and I'll work for you. Mm. But in the week, I'll have another job. So mm. in that job, I worked with a very well-known filmmaker, but she was very well-known to be totally a jallad. Like mm. nobody lasted more than one, two months with her. I lasted six months. <clears throat> so when people used to ask me, where do you work? And I'd say with so-and-so. And they'd be like, oh, since when? And i say, oh, since June. They're like, it's December. You must be a saint. You must be something. <laughs> she was pretty extreme. And basically after hiring me, she fired almost everybody else in the office. So, <laughs> doing all the work. <laughs> nice bakra. <laughs> and she, and there was, there was a secretary who was called a secretary, uh, whose name was Susan yeah. from Kerala. So Susan, and she would type, she was horrible. She used to make so many mistakes. I was continuously like correcting Susan's mistakes and saying, Susie, mm -hmm. type it again. Mm -hmm. And there was a boy called Anil. He used to wear an orange shirt uh, because he was a Shivsenic. And so he and I used to also have a lot of arguments. But basically, Susie, me, and Anil in this... <laughs> 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 And the office was in a place called Navjeevan Society. So mm. Navjeevan Society was apparently Bombay's first multi-story building and it was in Grand Road. But mm. now that was not in its best days. Mm. Now it was mostly famous for like sex work places and massage parlors. And also we used to continue to get phone calls. Mm. What services do you offer? So I used to very honestly say, we are filming, we make corporate films. We make <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I mean, Another thing was that and then actors used to keep coming and giving their photos, you know, then there were these photo albums. And one time, oh God, I hope the person, I don't remember his name, luckily, but there was one young assistant of the CA or the auditor or somebody who had been kept in the office to do some accounts work. And we were busy with the shoot, so I would be coming and going. And one day I forgot something, so I went back to the office and he was alone in the office. Oh no. <laughs> using the photos of the actresses to okay. Okay. <laughs> like the pride that. but I think kind of you know like real life and walking to the station and having all these experiences that you never knew in your little middle class existence you would ever have oh. <laughs> oh my god the thing about Navjeevan society was that it didn't have proper loop so actually Susie you started asking me every Thursday can I can I have the afternoon off, Paro? Then I have to go to the doctor. So now, so what's happened to you? 
and basically like i too was very like i have to go to the loo to i have to go to the loo but susie couldn't didn't want to use that dirty loo she wouldn't drink water so she felt sick okay. and actually i made a film called cute to pee many years later but really the thought began at that moment like when she said it and i was like susie but isn't it better to go to the loo than to not i mean i know it's dirty but but for susie she just couldn't you know so and susie had also come from kerala to work as a secretary and she was staying in some ladies hostel and she was also earning very little money so although she was from a very different cultural and class background than myself but there were these weird commonalities right of young people trying to make it in the city yes, yes. and very different people encountering each other it's not stratified to that extent as it is today i mean i'm not idealizing it but yes, yes, yes. anyway after 6 months i also finally broke down and had a fight and uh, left that job and around that time anand was working on ram ke naam so he said please come i need a full time assistant so basically as i working there full time so then um i would get sent to many like go to lamington road and get something fixed mm. go to the lab in the lab also so i was the only girl mm. who was a production assistant mm. so the girls didn't used to do production mm. girls used to do more genteel kind of jobs but production meant nothing much frankly it was like going and getting the developed roles of film or you know please stop me whenever my story becomes very too long and detailed no no i <laughs> i forgot the whole world now please so basically there there used to be a guy called jayesh in the lab and he was quite surly mm-hmm. and i've gotten quite badly scolded and all that in the lab also because like i didn't know anything much and the, my d- directors my bosses would just send me wahan par ja ke ye kar lo i feel a little ignorant then i'll go and say some wrong thing then i would get a scolding but you know after some time they got really used to me and they found me very funny like they found the idea of this girl in the Coming like again and again and again yeah mm-hmm. every they started asking are you coming for the 16 aaj 16 ke liye aayo ke 35 ke liye aayo because shukla da i mean the director whom i was working with she, she was working on 35 mm and anand was working on 16 mm it's perfect that was was working on the weekends also so that became a bit of a character right in the lab so they all knew me and eventually they were very like one they got very badly scolded by jayesh and i was like shaking and then he felt a little bad for me so then he explained to me that this you know if you make a mistake like this, it could cost us a lot of money and cost your and then your boss will not pay for it because you have given the wrong instruction so when you say this it means this and when you say that it means that that actually happened to me in many places because i went into a lot of kand in many places like i would say all wrong things i i was ignorant so mm-hmm. generally they would first shout at you and then they would explain it to you so in that one of these moments did you ever feel like i'm getting shouted at i want to leave no <laughs> Never, you know this is the thing. <laughs> Because this is the thing. Uh, like, mm. it, you feel a little bit embarrassed, mm. and it, there's a slight feeling of humiliation that comes from being scolded in front of others, and your ignorance being exposed in front of yeah. others. That was not the intent. Mm. They were not trying to belittle me. They were just focused on work. I mean, it's Bombay. Were But, you able to see it then? when it was happening it you you i mean it's it didn't feel unreasonable let me put it that way mm. like you might have thought like little bit crying in your brain that does he have to talk to me like but you know jayesh was very famously khadus also so i was scared of him some people were not khadus some people would explain things to you kindly and nicely but some people used to shout at you like it was that mm-hmm. i mean anand used to not shout at me used to explain everything he used to not explain first of all you just figure it out in your own mm. and when he would explain he would explain pretty nicely so there were all kinds of things right um and then after some time jayesh and i became such i i became such a charmer once i became confident then everybody in the lab knew me then i could get things done yeah like parumita you only ask him he listen <laughs> so you know that's also so cool right you become a kind of an insider just on the basis of your work relationships mm-hmm. it gives you a lot of ease you become very loose limbed and you start roaming around in the city like a mawali <clears throat> kabhi bhi idhar ya udhar ghoom rahe ho people are like are ye parmita mujhe udhar dikhi thi parmita mujhe udhar dikhi and mostly you know you would get sent because there was no internet and everybody didn't even have phones you would physically get sent to many places mm-hmm. like okay there's going to be a peace march mm-hmm. so now anand is going to volunteer that my assistant will go and deliver the press releases to <laughs> so, be pura 
चर्च गेट में टाइम्स ऑफ इंडिया मुंबई समाचार ऑफिस ब्लिट्स ऑफिस इधर उधर घूम के आई एम गिविंग दीज प्रेस रिलीजेस बट आई वुड नॉट स्वॉप दैट एक्सपीरियंस फॉर द वर्ल्ड बिकॉज आई गॉट टू नो द सिटी I walked all over like I still know so many parts of Bombay so well because I walked through all of them for work. It's not necessarily that I was exploring but I got to know them because I had to find places on my own, right? There was no Google Maps. Huh? Yeah, without phone. Yes. Without anything. So you have to ask people ke ye road kidhar hai and you know then the way I was thinking how did we find places that time but somehow we were finding places. Mm-hmm. So people would give you directions ke wahan utar ke ye karna then you will get lost and somebody tells you. So asking people for help being lost this was a condition of life mm. so if you ask me why did i not feel like oh how can they shout at me i mean that kind of a slight getting it done without precision was the was the nature of life and you got scolded with a i'm not saying that people should be scolded and then the boys were scolded much worse i got little less badly scolded because i was a girl definitely it wasn't done always in a very mean way right like it was generally like a kind of older people used to slightly is cold young people that time. it was a kind of given <clears throat> and so you didn't take it that seriously also is what i'm saying like ah oh, okay yeah. and uh, sometimes you would giggle and all that and then sometimes you would really get scolded then you would feel a bit shame faced but frankly even then we used to find it a bit funny <laughs> Yeah, just put it was a little bit funny. We found ourselves <laughs> funny. We found those people also funny. And <laughs> genuine. So the other thing that used to happen is to get sent to the sound lab for some transfers of sound and all. I won't go into the detail of what used to happen, but there also you'd meet other young people. You'd meet other assistants. Mm-hmm. Then you'd become friends with somebody. That person was only your lab friend. Mm-hmm. You met them in the lab, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's not necessary that you then met them afterwards or. but you kept running into them here and there because you all had to go to studios and things so that was a common kind of map mm. that you inhabited in the city <clears throat> but um there were also people there were technicians in the studio who had been working there for years they had so many stories and processes used to take time like say you go to do a transfer mm. that transfer happens in real time it's not like digital ke ek minute mein transfer ho gaya 10 minute mein it has moved from one hard disk to the other it's physically transferring from one piece of tape to another piece of tape so you just have to sit there for 3 hours you can't just like go off mm-hmm. and even if you go off your boss would be like oh how could you do it and how could you neglect it you have to sit there the whole time mm-hmm. but it was also pretty cool because sometimes amrish puri is coming for dubbing <laughs> yes is coming for dubbing then you're like acha with a back and you'll say ki are i saw this one that one which in documentary films people were like why are you so interested in bollywood it's was considered to be a little cheap mm-hmm. to like this. but i was totally like pretty excited and then you would also discover obscure things like in one studio that used to be in c rock hotel which isn't there anymore um used to be in front of what is now taj lands and there used to be another hotel called c rock hotel so c rock hotel mein swimming pool ke us side pe ek sound studio hota tha i don't know why it was there mm-hmm. but you to cross the swimming pool and go to the sound studio mm-hmm. so there i heard the dubbing of a new film called ramgarh ke shole It was a parody oh, of oh, oh, oh. you know, so there's the thing that you're like all the time discovering something very interesting and the world is like really dunya ka mela you know you feel that feeling when so i think those things then if you are going somewhere during ramzan time then you discover that multicolored faluda mm. all those things then i used to this uh, sometimes anand would open the fridge and he'd be like whose food it has to be paromita's food because i'd always bring some weird food and keep it in the fridge <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to also right? so just keep it that not mm-hmm. eat it right? mm-hmm. so that tolerance also for that mm-hmm. as long as you worked very hard there was a certain tolerance for that mm-hmm. so i think yeah, you learned a lot in that uh, atmosphere of, of apnapan you you used to get scolded by everybody i don't know if you read i wrote a column when chandita mukherjee died about being scolded by her also mm-hmm. that was working for her but mm-hmm. i did do something bad mm-hmm. and she offered me some work and i didn't get back to her about it because mm-hmm. I don't know. I got scared or something. Mm. Bad behavior on my part. And when she met me, she said, "What is this behavior? How can you be so non-serious?" Mm. And that also was like Mrs. Patak scolding yes. me. So yeah, that was how it was to start working. I mean, no money. Um, actually, really, no money for anything much except basic existence mm. and uh, learning a lot, meeting many, many kinds of people, making many, many new friends. 
and feeling scared, feeling lost, feeling I really don't know what I'm going to do next. It's not like today people have a lot more pathways. So, but you know, somehow you just went from one thing you liked to another thing you liked. And then over time, of course, with liberalization, things changed and the media opened up and more opportunities also came up. So it's not that it was just this idyllic adventuring. It was that at a certain kind of economic moment, suddenly there were more jobs in media. And I was uniquely placed to have some of those jobs because I loved Hindi films. Mm. Because I loved Hindi films, I, I could work in Channel V and I knew so many Hindi film songs. Okay. So, yeah, I sort of straddled those worlds, you no know, politics and mainstream comfortably. So I was able to do more things. And so then slowly, slowly, you know, I got a little bit more settled. I made my first film in 1995. And I think a lot of the things that worked out for me, because if you look back at my career also, it's kind of the whole thing seems like improbable. Mm -hmm. uh, like how, did this, how can it be that there is such a person actually? But I think it's just some of it is luck. Some of it is sticking it out. Some of it is uh, willing to try out things. You know, like you, I, I, I did a lot of different, I, I wrote a soap opera. Uh, I mean, yes, I worked in Channel V. Then I worked with Manju Singh for some time. Even that was very comical. I used to reach work late, two hours, three hours. And, like, but, I mean, all sorts of things were happening. But it's not that I was holding myself. Was, I was not saving myself for something special. I was just doing things and then some things was happening. You know, there would be some alchemy from all of that. And yeah, then life took on a certain kind of shape, work shape. No. <laughs> no. When you told us that story about uh, you know, running after Anand carrying bags and equipment and things like that, uh, I was thinking you were also a young woman in the city working for a man. Um, and because so much of your work is also foregrounded in feminism and women and love and desire relationships. Uh, mm. As a young woman, how did, did you ever have to reconcile this that because, you know, I, I also work with young women and um, I also work with young men and older men and lots of different, basically everybody. But the idea is when you are working and you're discovering also feminism and, but the world will only see it as she's still a young girl running after a man, where is the feminism, blah, blah, blah. And all that. Balance, was there ever a moment where you had to balance or were you always like, screw this, I'm learning and that's more feminist than anything else and. What was it like? No, I mean, I think it was a very big factor, you know? I mean, the idea of feminism as not just something that you... I mean, I, I found it very intrigued by people whose bios say feminist. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, of course. Like, if you ask me, are you a feminist? I always say, yeah. I'm not a feminist, I'm a hardcore feminist. You know that? And this, there, was a, there was a young man who worked on a project that I was heading, and he told my editor that, show right? <laughs> <laughs> hard lady I mean I'm those things but the thing is like I always find it intriguing uh, I mean there's a doing and there's a continuous changing so this like settled word as a bio descriptor has always puzzled me um, and I feel that's one of the things that has changed of course there were women who were feminist activists and they used to be called those feminists the feminists the feminists will get angry that kind of conversation used to happen so, but the thing is that I think when your uh, your feminism is happening, not so much through theory, but through the sets of experiences where you're having to define yourself, articulate yourself. And again, I would say I was very lucky to go to Miranda House and have the teachers that I had because they did provide some, I won't say they provided a vocabulary. That was the greatest thing. It was not about giving us words, yeah. but giving us concepts and ideas and frames and questions and always through the work. Actually, I remember that once I went to a study circle on feminism, but most of all, we were really talking about the texts and critiquing the texts. And it's from that that some of the feminism, like for me, oh, the great, it's so silly that I remember this story, but obviously meant a lot. To me. But it's, I must have told you this Fanny Price story. Yes. <laughs> Mansfield Park was a text in college. Yes. And write, and write about something, something. And then I was like, this Fanny Price is a very irritating girl. And whenever anybody's having a good time, she gets a headache. Because she does, right? 
And actually, obviously, what I was trying to express that I find her priggish and I don't know understand why she's the heroine of the book. And the book, like after reading Pride and Prejudice, suddenly look at Mansfield Park, you feel like, what's going on with me? What's going on with me? Yeah. I'm sorry, Jane Austen. Mansfield Park. So, and I remember that Dr. Sundarajan, who corrected my paper, wrote and was like, brava. He's like, brava, what's going on? You know, brava. Brava, what's going on? So, I think about that. To be rewarded for saying what you think. Yes. It's a great encouragement that you actually, the things that you think matter. Uh, this and that you should make them better and stronger and you're not just rewarded for being a little bit smart after that you're supposed to rigorously keep improving so i think that there was a way that was one thing the, but the other thing was yeah i didn't fit in i i wasn't considered to be a girl because one i wasn't good looking i was fat i was strange i was awkward i was shy many things so i wasn't really in the kind of scene like i'm not a girl you know so that also had its own like criss crosses i felt many different things about it um but uh you do notice right like you do notice if you're not typical uh, i mean it's a double consciousness like like in a way like when you say that if you're a colonized person you you can see two things at the same time no so it is when you're outside of that cool kind of a framework you can see how it's working you can see which which girls get what kind of attention maybe you can't see what attention you're getting because you have been schooled to think only certain things are attention see all of those things are happening mm -hmm. when you start to stay on your own you do confront uh people you're, you're scared of people people do feel that they can harass you a little bit or be mean to you and all that happened when i began living on my own mm -hmm. um i do think there were some feminists Who later became my friends who were like, oh, we didn't like you because. But I was only twenty or twenty three. Like I don't know why I was like that's ridiculous on your part for not liking. Yeah. yeah. But they did feel that you know devoting her energies to a man, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. Um. <clears throat> How do you feel about this now, in retrospect? I mean, I don't see it that way. I yeah. mean, I think that I was devoted. I, I, I obviously idealized uh, my boss. Many of us do when we start out working. Uh, I learned a lot, but I also began to disagree a lot over mm -hmm. time, right? And that I would say that was a feminist thing. Like I didn't agree with certain things. I had a very strong opinion about many things, and that was. And I also had a strong opinion about the idea of being an assistant, who was only to serve and not to be given importance. Mm -hmm. And maybe that seems very arrogant, but I don't think it was actually. Mm -hmm. So some people did. One or two people told me, "Are you are behaving like a hysterical feminist?" And I'm like, "What is this thing you're saying?" So I used to fight a lot. I was always fighting a lot at that age. Did you know how to ask for things you wanted? No, I didn't really know. So a lot of it was like feeling angry or feeling that I'm not getting taken seriously or feeling that something is not okay. But fighting about it rather than being able to identify calmly and coolly. But I don't think you can when you're 23. Like it would be very dumb if you. I think you're dumb if you can identify it so well. Yeah. Because yeah. you've thrown yourself into a world that you don't know, yeah. and it's not a common world. So it will. You'll have to suffer through it. Mm. You'll have to make them also suffer you, right? It's not that people, <laughs> you know, I never thought of it like that. You have to make them suffer you. Yeah, because you're also fighting and being rude, yes. and they're also tolerating it and saying that what is this? So there is this conflicted kind of a thing, right? Mm. A lot of like when I quit my job there and was freelancing and feeling a bit lost, a lot of people saying that you should say that that you still work. For somebody important, in order to be seen as important, all of that was present. So there was a lot of conflictedness and, and anger about it, mm -hmm. and wanting to assert yourself. And I think that's part of your twenties for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that over time, and I think it's fine. You should you should put yourself in all kinds of situations, and you should also be at odds with them. Mm -hmm. That's how you learn who you are. It takes quite a lot of time. To, I mean, I'm still learning, right? So you're continuously learning who you are as you work, and you're in different situations and. Yeah, so I didn't see it in some absolute or binary way, mm. and I worked with many other men afterwards, and many other women, and many other kinds of people. So you know, mm. has continued. Mm. Okay. <laughs> My last. Uh, so basically, I like have three more questions, but at one point I'm going to have to stop and ask or the audience if they have a question. But if the audience has questions. You can start putting it now. And I also know you have a song for us because 
I don't know song, but I can make a song. I mean, I can get a song. <laughs> uh, when when did you know when you wanted to leave and start something of your own? I didn't know all this. Please, I, like I'm definitely one of those people who like करते करते जो भी हो जाता है do it. So I made my first film very young, but not because I was so driven and so like you know cool. This I had the opportunity to make a film, and then I took it. I think that my thing is mostly when I get an opportunity, then I make the best of it. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm definitely if you can't have the one you love, then love the one you're with kind of a character. So a lot of it was like you know some there was it was 1995. It was the Beijing Conference of Women. There was somebody who wanted to make a film about a women's organization in India, and a friend, somebody I had worked with actually a woman I had assisted. when she was in india on research who later became a good friend of mine and we worked together also american woman um she recommended my name and i said yes i'll do it and i had uh, when i had become friends with some people in the textile mill workers union so i used to roam around in that area quite a bit and go to some gate meetings and like basically i was not going there because i was again i want to specify that it was not i was some politically Uh, advanced character but mostly it was like ha huh, i like them this is cool wow this area is amazing look at the mills like it was just a kind of curiosity mm-hmm. i suddenly feeling intrigued and attracted to this entire history and the struggle of the mill workers right so i was very enchanted with that neighborhood and i knew there was a women's organization there anapurna and i knew that they made the bus for migrant work i mean for for the migrant workers who worked in the mills right so i said that i would like to make a film about this organization and it's a very simple film anapurna about what is the worth of women's work how women get eased out of the labor force mm-hmm. and then you know work in unorganized sectors mm-hmm. and cooking is not considered to be really work so and there's women's cooperatives so it was a very simple feminist film actually really start of film in a way so start of film if you want to think about feminism and a start of film as a feminist filmmaker also for me but uh, you know and then it was a nice film i mean it was a nice film it is a nice film mm-hmm. Uh, but it's not like it you know shattered anybody's uh, life in a good or bad way like it people just felt like as yeah, a nice film and um, it went to one or two festivals which is the kind of thing that happened then and nothing much else but it's just that then one thing leads to the other then you make some new friends i ended up writing skin deep which is a documentary that uh, reena mohan made Sabiha Sumar was a Pakistani filmmaker. She was looking for a writer, and my friend Sanjay Kak was her neighbor. And he said, "There's a pretty interesting girl in Bombay. You can see if she can write it. Like just that random." And she called me up and she said, uh, "You know, I have the script, and you, you know, I want someone to write the script. I have the story." And I said, "Okay, I'll do it. You need to pay me to live for two months, and I'll do it." Like I was also a very stupid character, money wise. And I wrote Khamush Pani without ever meeting the director. Like. I had written the full script before I actually met her, so I think you know that's really what used to happen with me. Something would happen, I would do it, and then I would do it the best I could with the most gusto I could and very sincerely. And sometimes it really worked out in a great way, and sometimes it just was like okay. But I, yes, it is true that when I made Unlimited Girls, that was I would say it's a significant moment in my life because around ten years of working, ten years of thinking about feminism and being feminist. um and then getting the chance to make a film about feminism uh but also digital video comes in and you can do all this experimentation which you couldn't have done before right so it gave me a chance to kind of find my own creative voice in a way that i had been building up to for 10 years it's not that i had it innate but i i i don't know when i look back i think like how the fuck did i make that movie like was what was i on because today <laughs> I fear it. I think so much. Or oh, will people laugh at me? Or if I do this, like there wasn't a film like that which existed. Yes. And there was no like there was no image to make the film in. But just making it because that's how I felt and that's how I liked it. And you know, everybody worked on the film not for a lot of money. Like even I didn't earn much money. A friend of mine sent me a thousand dollars as my birthday present because she said, "I know you're making this film, so you don't have any money." So that was really I was very lucky in that way. So I think. that that was a more important turning point for me that finding my own tongue mm-hmm. and <clears throat> finding a community of people mm-hmm. who were also interested in these ideas so time out bombay had just started and i remember nandini ramnath was working there 
Mandeep Jha was working in uh, Indian Express, and she came to interview me about an earlier film which I made, and then she became my friend because mm-hmm. after the interview she decided she was my friend. So we became. <laughs> she asked me to write something for the paper. I had never written anything in a newspaper, but she said, "No, I think you can." Like because I used to live next door to all these bar dancers. So when the shop girls act, that factories act where you can't work at night and all that happened, there was some change in the act. So she said, "Why don't you write a piece about you? You said so many things about going by the last." Local at night, and you you know just write about that. So actually, it's also about finding those people who say that I think what you're saying is interesting. I want to hear about it. Mm-hmm. Then I became the agony auntie in Time Out, and then I used to do food reviews and all that. So it was also part about being part of that community of people who are doing other things. So Aram se us cheez ka hissa ho jana, writing about Simi Garewal, writing about Himesh Reshamia, like all of these things happened alongside making films, mm-hmm. and over time it grew into something, right? Like it allowed you to. understand who you are what you're interested in what your polit- politics are mm-hmm. and what's the artistic language you're seeking as well so i would say that's how it was i never like when agents of ish which is the thing you could say mm-hmm. i made it my own happen also it was just a response to something mm-hmm. uh, i never wanted to create an organization i just wanted to do a project for mm-hmm. projects project so, two years Mm-hmm. Okay. For two years i'll do this thing that basically there was all these new aib and all this and i felt that they were very mean to people who don't know about sex mm. and i thought like well just tell people no if they're ignorant just tell them yeah and desire etc was an interest of mine always been an interest of mine love desire intimacy has been an important prism through which i've understood politics so i guess in that sense i i agent of fish came in so late in my life no i was like more than 45 years old when i started agents of fish mm-hmm. so it's like a kind of new chapter almost mm-hmm. but you do have little more confidence to start something which is not just you making a film at such a time mm-hmm. but it's also because i had some friends like that like i was friends with nisha and jugal and all these people and they had started ladies finger mm-hmm. so then you know when you see your friends doing something you feel like chap main bhi kar sakti hu agar wo log kar sakte hain to shayad main bhi kar sakti hu mm-hmm. it's like wearing sarees also happened because of having some friends i had never worn sarees then i said there really? i thought i i mean i I've always imagined even sarees for some reason. Started some six seven years ago. That only अपने दोस्तों को देख देख के कि अच्छा they are looking pretty good. Maybe I'll also look okay. चल I'll also try. So actually that's how you I that's how I end up doing most of the things I do. Mm-hmm. Now the crux of the evening. What has happened? <laughs> I know I've talked for so much time. I can I think I should like just be a talking person. <laughs> Sleep, so I have no problem in no that. No complaints. I I can't tell you how many people's lives are doing dub 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 at this moment, listening to you. But the, what's so the evening meaning? Yeah, there are two questions. I mean, questions we'll get to later. I'm I'm keeping you for me for some more time. I uh, if you ask, what has changed? Yeah, yeah, no, like what has happened? How did? And I know this also because I've seen your work, mm-hmm. and now I see. Like small people. When I say small, I mean sorry, not small. Young people doing mm-hmm. even like two percent of the things that you've already done, but getting celebrated and appreciated and like, applauded. And I don't know how you feel, but it kills me. And uh, I mean, when it happens to you, it kills me. I've seen that happen. Uh, that's one part of the question the other part is what has happened i mean where is the just for work where is the let me go and find myself today i'll go out and find myself i'll go and work and i'll make friends something like that what is happening i think many things obviously and yes there are still a few people who still do that and the other day i was talking to my friend amrita and she was saying that you know maybe every generation just has a few people like this not that Not that the whole generation was like it's us. Very sad for some reason. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, like, yeah, maybe there are just a few people in every generation who don't like stick to the straight and narrow. That's one thing. I I think for me, what I faced, I think the, a few things that I can uh, discernibly see have changed. Like I can concretely describe is that. So you know, this unmoderated, unscripted journey, whether of desire, whether of work, whether of selfhood, whether of language, there was no script. Yes, you come from certain privilege, but then you also not living inside that privilege exactly. The privilege doesn't leave you, obviously. I mean, I always I went to good schools. I could speak English. Even when I lived in tenement housing, I, it was difficult at first because I was a minority, middle class girl living on my own in a working class neighborhood. 
But over some years, that equation also shifted, right? Why I was no longer on the back foot. I was no longer uncertain because more middle class people came and began to live in that tenement housing mm -hmm. colony. So, you know, these dynamics persist, but to an extent, you are embarking on a journey which doesn't have a fixed destination. Mm -hmm. It's not a schema, you know, mm -hmm. and you're not pretending to be some of when I look back, my arguments were not just about being feminist or not in many contexts, mm -hmm. but it was that kind of a liberal schema mm -hmm. that to be secular, elite, liberal, it means these, these things, these are the things you like, these are things you don't like, that politics is done by a kind of catechism or in a canonical way, right, that you don't discover politics as you do it, and you don't come up against contradictions and confusions, and even learn to accept things that you feel very uneasy about mm -hmm. or find very difficult, right? So I think that's always been there, that it's difficult to fight against that. But the potential for an unscripted journey was definitely more because today all journeys are pre-scripted, right? And social media and capitalism allow you to think that you are free when you are in fact conforming. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the fact that you learn to describe yourself with a label before you've really learn to find yourself, right? Like first, you're already 20, 19 or something and you're writing intersectional feminist in your LinkedIn bio. Why do the LinkedIn bio at 19, first of all? Like- It's so funny. I've seen it too. It's hilarious. It's romance novels, man. Don't like make a LinkedIn bio. Kuch nahi wala LinkedIn bio. So that I can guarantee. <laughs> intersectional feminist, not a feminist. So, you know, but you're learning to describe yourself in that way with a label. You're learning to describe yourself in terms of gender and sexuality. So you're stepping into a prescribed box of so-called counterculture. But that counterculture has been decided for you by somebody else. So in a way, of course, I think people will have journeys out of those spaces. But I think what I feel differently, feel as different is that, see, at least in the work that I do, like there was so little gain that you really had to be a bit of a like slightly loser like I was a little bit of a loser character <laughs> who didn't belong. Nobody would have given me a job in a posh office, to be mm -hmm. honest. I mean, so people who didn't fit in, who didn't want to fit in, who didn't fit in, actually. It's not that they, it's not that I didn't want to fit in. I didn't fit in. Mm -hmm. I didn't belong anywhere. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of characters were coming to documentary. But like, why did you documentary? Because now you will become rich. Now you will become famous. Now, and you will swiftly learn that if you're a woman, you're not going to become glamorous either. Mm -hmm. You know, for men, there's an eroticism about being an artist, about being an activist. Yeah. Women, there is no such. Yeah, it, we all want to serve you and we will write free transcriptions. I also worked free na, for some people. But that doesn't happen to you. So I think that what you do uh, come to, uh, what you recognize now is that people have these labels, they are walking down those roads and that is preventing them from Maybe learning about themselves a little bit more. I think it's more scripted now. Is it more scripted? Is it? It's predefined, right? So then you stick inside that definition. And then because there is so much conformity asked for you on social media, it's very fearful to leave. Now, what if you. Say, pressure? Is there a pressure? It is. It is. People, a, it people is. like using this word. There's pressure on young people. Is there? There's always pressure. There was pressure to get married. Girls got married in second year when I was in college. So there's always pressure. But I think that the complication is that now there is a kind of world which which seems to be like it's not a conformist world. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of conformity in that world, right? Like you are expected to conform to certain political positions and not just positions, but articulations. You must use certain language in certain way. You must use certain terms. And there's a lot of fear of departing from that because then who are you and where are you? Because when you're young, you're always lost. Mm -hmm. So... Now that thing of, you know, turning the alternative into the mainstream, which is what capitalism has done and social media has really enabled, and homogenizing that which is heterogeneous and unmoderated, that makes it quite tough because a lot of people want to work in this kind of work as if it's a corporate job. Yeah. It's not. Yes. But who can blame them for feeling that way? Because... You know, I mean, if I think about how an agent's wish started and that there was nothing like it. And then I see how many people took bits and pieces, bits and pieces, and it's so easy to mimic. 
without going into the depth of what agents of ish does and then do like huge like scale up very fast and you can't really say much about it because then you just sound like you know you have sour grapes so you're jealous so you're turfish so in a sense you just have to keep doing what you're doing and keep being that and not of course you get mad sometimes i mean i'm <laughs> as we all know like not known for my speech <laughs> but <laughs> so you get mad but you know that's that, that's the breaks there's nothing much you can do I, i always feel like people sometimes ask you how come you are not invited to such thing how can there be such and such event without you in it i'm always like why are you asking me like i didn't make the event so if you care that much about who i am or what I'm or what you think should accrue to me then ask those people but you're not right because you are too fearful of questioning that edifice because that's really sticking out so there is that thing that's unfair right like people in private will tell you you matter so much but not as much in public so i think there are all of these things that have happened uh, over time but i think maybe they do happen in general so what can you do like you cannot change the whole world you can change some bit of it you can try but eventually you have to make a little peace with your obscurity <laughs> i think you are seeing a moment where we might uh be able to rescue ourselves from this horrid corporate corporatization uh and a term that you used when we were talking about this is reptilian tantrums uh yes. they are <laughs> I, I, you know they do they won't do this in a corporate world no so, because, yeah. yeah and but they do it in a more not corporate place how do you see that I mean that's the politics right that you want actually so much of life has become about art direction see i mean the thing is that life is art direction for most people mm-hmm. who you take a selfie with people are art direction mm-hmm. and so i think very often people want to have a job which will be an art directed political job that does happen mm-hmm. like i want the right kind of cool job but it should also pay me like x and this should also happen and that should also happen and let me say i'm not saying that people shouldn't want more from mm-hmm. life Mm-hmm. people should not be like me who like in the you know the sage is like oh well either not able to ask properly for money or whatever, or get very angry if somebody doesn't offer me what i think they should offer me etc so i feel like on the one hand there is a confidence there is a clarity in asking for that and that that is something to be applauded i i won't say that it's a bad thing but i think to have to define yourself always through those things is very tough mm-hmm. because if you define yourself only by how much money you get Mm. then it's it's a kind of it's you're completely giving power to other people mm. one thing is to decide your own value yeah. but the thing is if you decide your own value only in those terms then you never really have a sense of who you are and what you are right and that's ditto for politics if you decide your value only in terms of the labels that you carry it becomes extremely hard to leave that mm. that's why there's so much conformity and fear and anxiety about that. so i think well we all live inside capitalism we all engage with it in some way or the other it shapes our lives it shapes our emotions so you know at the most it's like the matrix <laughs> so you have to be able to see it and know it and then try to try to wrest some freedom for yourself from it and not become totally sucked in if that's what you want uh, but i think yes it's true most people will not stand up to the power outside mm-hmm. so they will always stand up to the thing that they can fight with because you think you're so ethical fine then you should be this way and you should be that way no and in principle there's nothing wrong with that but it's like that no you fight the easy fight you're not fighting the bigger fight so yeah that does happen i think thank you for your patience i've been <laughs> no, i think I, mean, i would say one other thing that you know one of the things that capitalism really rewards is mediocrity oh my god yes oh yes that's the other word how could i forget So yeah. the anger that people feel when they're asked to excel, or when they're asked to dig a little deep, they feel angry. They feel angry with you, maybe, but actually they are feeling angry about something. They are feeling angry with themselves. So there is a lot of uneasiness. You know, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll do say that in the last ten years, because I work with a very large number of people, um, and I have been. I'm not at all trying to say I'm very perfect. Like I, I am a flawed person, and there would be many things I do wrong, and. you know sometimes people stand up to you and sometimes people correct you for the things you've done and you know you have to learn like you ha- that, that is what working does mm-hmm. it takes away your edges you have to learn a certain mutuality and you have to continuously be open to changing 
how you do things, what you do. And it's not easy. Like sometimes you feel angry. Sometimes you feel like, what the fuck? Why should I? I'm, you can tell yourself, I'm doing so much, I'm doing so much. So you go through those things, but you should always, I think, be open. You should try to be open to a conversation and change the way that you do things and try to see the reason in what people say. But there can't be a demand that you be for me. I'm being for me, actually. I'm being for me, what I want to be, what I want to do. And I want to do really good work. I want to do the best I can possibly do at a given time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that I've learned in the last few years working with large numbers of people, there are very few people who want to do that, who want to give something their all, because there is a lot of reward for not doing that. The internet especially rewards people for recycling things. Yes. Right? Media is you put it here, you have like 25,000 likes, 500,000 likes for saying whatever some other book has already said which is very different from making art. No? Agents of Ish is an art space project. So that means you have to make everything from scratch. You have to think the thought, you have to frame the concept, you have to work as for an idea. It is very, very, very difficult. I'm nobody saying it's easy, like it's tough, but I think it matters, like it's worth doing because it makes a difference. Why do you think they're getting pissed off with, uh, when, when people push them to say, you, you, you know, because essentially it's saying, I know you can do better. That's actually what is being said. No, if I refuse your mediocrity and say no, do better. Where is the pissing off coming from? Where is the anger coming from? Because I think you have to change many things about yourself, right? I mean, it's a political question mm -hmm. to uh, to work hard at something to try to make it the best. It is to try to understand it for itself and not by some predetermined indices. Uh, is like even when you write something, to think that if you're writing even some, you know ordinary post like what is the difference between a vulva and a vagina and that still you've got to give it your best yes idea people oh, don't yes. communication to a mixed public mm -hmm. people who are not like yourself how mm -hmm. can i do it how can i reach more people how can i without diluting my thought reach a lot of people this requires a lot of work it's damn hard mm -hmm. and you make mistakes and you don't know the answer you have to keep on and on refining it right so this desire, like it's so outside this very like caste based world we live in. Mm. Because mm. everything is like, you know, it has become very easy to say that you're intersectional by using certain words, by learning properly the homework oh God. of what it means without actually embodying it, without losing something of yourself. You cannot become a new thing if you won't let go some old thing. So now, Everybody colors inside the lines, but they color in neon. So they think they are different. That's all it is, right? <laughs> and you say, oh, wow. Oh, my God. That's the line, line of the evening. They're coloring in neon. Yes. Oh, so God. That's what it is. And so, you know, there are people who love it. Like, I remember once somebody wrote a piece for AOI, uh, Anonymous. And at that time, I used to edit the pieces. Now I don't. But and I we went back and forth. And then the person wrote saying, uh, I just want to say that uh, I think I've become a better writer in the time. Thank you for pushing me. To... And I was like, wow, that is so nice to hear that, right? And actually, uh, uh, that person applied for a job in AOI two, three times and didn't get it. And then I didn't know it's the same person. It was anonymous. And then subsequently, they applied for an internship. Why is this person applying for an internship? They've been working for seven, eight years. But they were like, okay, let them come. And then at some point, then they worked with us for a little while longer. And then one day they told me that, you know, I am the person who wrote that piece. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, that was such a beautifully written piece. I still remember it. So I think sometimes there are people who are really searching to, searching to express themselves in a big way. And then you encounter them and it's awesome. And there are many such people. Let me say there are many such people. <laughs> many so hope here, hope here. Okay. Now I will share the world. <laughs> now it is time. Now that I have, okay, I think Shreya Ghosh, oh, Pranay has, okay, I think we'll start from the bottom. Pranay, <laughs> if you were to invite someone you have worked with to Meta, who would that be? Sanjay Bansali. Really? Ooh. People, actually. Um, I mean, yeah, oh, I don't know, kind of a crazy guy. So, it would, I mean, like, quite something. I admire him a lot. Um. I would invite, well, my friend Hansa has already come to Meta. Yes, no, she's come to uh, our Social Justice Film Festival. Yes, yes come to St. Joseph's, yeah. Uh, I would invite my friend Rahul Shivastav, who was in Pukar. I mean, I learned a lot from him. I would invite 
so many people actually that I've worked with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can't remember all of them right now, but yeah. I mean, say someone like Gaurav Gera. I mean, he acted in Unlimited Girls and he acted again in The Consent Lavni. But I think he has done something so unusual. Like he was the first person to do that kind of slightly porno kind of, you know, gender bending kind of content on YouTube. And I love the shopkeeper. Not at all respectable. <laughs> like, I can't stop watching, but I should not. Like, <laughs> but, uh, so I feel like these are people who've done interesting things. It would be so amazing to hear their journeys, right? Shreya Ghosh asks, when did you start living alone and how did you make peace with the loneliness of it all? Of it all? Mm-hmm. It all is not lonely. <laughs> Sometimes there's loneliness no matter what sometimes. And of course, living on your own has its kind of loneliness. Living with other people has its kind of loneliness. So um, I started living on my own when I was 22 or 3. 23, I guess. Well, no, 22 maybe, yeah. And uh, 22, I started living on my own. And 23 is when I began to live in PMGP colony, which I considered really proper because I kept getting evicted from here then and every that, but a tough time first. But I finally came to live in PMGP, which was a tenement housing colony. And I lived there for many years before I shifted to this house that I live in now. So I think, uh, I don't think about it like that. Like, first of all, I work a lot. I'm always busy, always traveling. I when I lived in PMGP, it was kind of like a big hostel. There were a lot of young people there living on their own as well. And none of us properly knew how to cook. So we kind of grew up together to live on, like we became a little bit adults together and learned recipes and bought proper bartans over time, like got a pressure cooker, got a gas. <laughs> we didn't have all that in the beginning, right? So I think it really helped because you had that kind of company um, and uh Subsequently, I think what happens is here's how I dealt, not dealt with, but here's how engaged with the idea of living on my own. Um, The first time that I moved to PMGP colony, I had all my stuff packed in cardboard boxes. I I mean, you know, it was a tenement housing colony to anybody else. It might look like, oh my God, you're living in like one step up from a trawl. But for me, I was like, there's a view, there's a tiny room. It was also like a doll's house. So I was pretty excited. But at the same time, I was like, I didn't really know how to do it. So I kept my boxes in the house. I locked the flat, a flat, I locked the room and I left. And I came back after two days. I went to stay with my uncle and I came back after two days. There was a hole through all my boxes, top to bottom. All of them. And everything in the box, books, clothes, candles, gloves. Yeah. But I didn't know what it was. So I was like crying because everything I had, (laughs) had a hole in it. And yeah, basically it was these really huge Bombay rats and they had eaten up my stuff and I had a big struggle with rats. That was my biggest struggle in life was rats. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dealing with rats only took up some two, three years to like, <laughs> manage it. And mm-hmm. there was a lot of drama of rats and having babies and all that. So some of it is that there's a lot of physical difficulty when you start living on your own. The second is a lot of temporal difficulty. You don't know how to manage mm-hmm. uh, stocking your house, cooking in time, like doing all of those things, cleaning up, like doing housework and going to work and all of that. I did find it a bit tough, but I think at one point I decided, like I would always run away. I go and stay in some friend's house and go somewhere and go somewhere, like spend a lot of nights out. But finally, I just said to myself that, you know, I really got to make this house into a place that I I want to have a house that's a refuge, a place that I am in. Mm -hmm. One thing that I did was started to decorate. Like decoration was a very big part of making that space my own. And that no money. So it was really like some cushion cover from my mom. Somebody gave something, somebody gave something. But in that, you know, young people, like you have your hostel room and you pretty it up a bit. It was really like that. The second thing is that I told myself I will make dinner for myself every day. Wow. So actually that learning to cook ordinary food. Because before that, I couldn't cook fancy food from recipe books. <laughs> <laughs> learning how to make normal food. Just doing those things for yourself bit by bit gave me a practice. Mm-hmm. And it took quite some years before I became like an accomplished housekeeper for myself. And I feel it's a very important part of living on your own. Like you should love your home and you should treat it lovingly and you should make it a place that you really like to come back to. Um, and you should do the things that you need to do to look after yourself. You should be able to look after yourself. You should be able to cook a meal you should be able to cook a meal for other people. You should be able to have a party. I think it's very important to know how to have a party. <laughs> I have a party is very young. I mean, mm-hmm. and 
I have good parties and mm. I don't, don't order biryani for my parties. I cook for the party. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. I've never seen ordered biryani in your Instagram photos whenever you have parties. I, uh, I might even not come to your house again if you do. So <laughs> where's my biryani for your And yeah. you're already obsessed. We always obsessed with what, what you cook at your parties. Because yeah. there'll be next day there'll be like all of these montage of the beautiful food. <laughs> Yeah. But you should be able to do that. I feel like it's a skill. One should learn these things. I was a very shy and awkward person. And I think living on my own and being on my own so much taught me how to get over it. A, a way that really teaches you to get over your awkwardness and shyness is just good manners. Mm -hmm. Just like the basic good manners of asking people what they do and having ordinary conversations with people helps you to overcome your awkwardness. You, you should cultivate a sense of curiosity and I think I also learned how to uh, slightly save myself, protect myself from the gaze of others. I didn't unthinkingly become friends with all my neighbors because mm -hmm. I knew that living on my own meant that you're always in that ambiguous, ambiguous kind of identity. I was also very aware, like I was sensible and aware, but not terrorized mm -hmm. by my being on my own. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, Pushpa, who comes to cook for me everyday food, <laughs> said... Uh, that I don't know how you stay on your own when you're sick. I'm crying when I'm sick. <laughs> you are in a big hurry to cry all the time, Pushpa and whatever. So like the thing is that I don't actually feel respected when I'm sick. Let me put it that way. I mean, that it's okay. So what if you're sick? Like, yeah, if somebody comes and looks after you, that's pretty nice. So I think in short, what I'm saying is there's a very sentimental idea about how it's terrible if you're sick and alone, but it's actually, it's not, it's pretty okay. You take a person and you go to sleep and then you feel better. That's all it is, right? But there's nothing bad about it. These are just notions yeah. that you are a pitiful creature if you're alone. That is like a thing that has been sold to you to prevent you from actually enjoying your own company. And once you start letting go of some of, the, we have those ideas when you start living on your own, you feel those things. But once you start letting go of some of that stuff, right? That's also true, I think, because I know that you're, some of you are thinking this, but also true about relationships and dating. That if somebody acts like an asshole with you, your first thought is something about me. I also said that many times when I was young. Something about me must be making people treat me like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, therapy will show you that maybe there are some things you're doing which are causing difficult things to happen to you and you're not protecting yourself from them. But the second thing is somebody else is, is a jerk with you that doesn't determine your value. Mm -hmm. So you can feel your hurt and you can feel your anger and even your humiliation, but you should not start feeling high kismat. So th that is a sentimental notion of self. I would really say you have to let go of it. And then you'll know when you really need help, right? Like it can become a habit to make yourself alone. Recently, my friend called up and said that, oh, do you know that our other friend has got pneumonia? Do you mimic yourself? Do I mimic myself? Do no, no. What did you say? It's a habit to what yourself? Mimic yourself. I don't think I said mim mimic. Sorry. I said, yes, but I've forgotten. <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, the other day my friend called up and said that a third friend of ours has got pneumonia and we didn't know. So obviously we called her up and scolded her and sent her food and said, come and stay here or I'll come and stay there, whatever. So I think you can become, it can become a habit to make yourself isolated. Make you yourself. Okay, make yourself. I heard me. <laughs> you shouldn't make yourself alone. I mean, it's an important thing to remember that you should, uh, you have to keep working on keeping community and keeping relationships with people. And you do lose friendships over time. It's very normal in life to lose friendships and you make new friends and, you know, that's an ongoing, ongoing thing, part of life. So you have to find ways not to make yourself alone. Mm. And it's how you feel alone. Everybody does. Like you're not special if you feel alone. Everybody feels alone. <laughs> No, I want the liberty of seeing which questions you want to answer. Uh, there are two questions at the top that we haven't looked at yet and one last question at the bottom. In many instances, individuals may refrain from pursuing a specific field or task due to a perceived sense of not fitting in. Could you I can't provide any insights on how one can deal with it because everybody deals with their circumstances differently. I can only share what I did, but it may not work for you, right? So I wouldn't... Like, I think the benefit of listening to other people talk about their lives is to get a sense of possibility. Yeah, yeah it can be done. And this, and if this person used what they had, what is it that I have that I could use for my own journey, right? Like, that's really the thing. Like, to be a little curious, 
people uh, like confuse being self absorbed with being curious about themselves you have to be curious about what you don't know about yourself mm. you don't know how much guts you've got yet maybe you have more guts than you think you have right so actually i feel something is put yourself in a slightly uncomfortable situation from time to time don't always want to be in a comfort zone now it it's too easy to be right like everybody's parents are very i think the big thing that's changed vijayta people talk to their parents every day people talk to their parents every day every day <laughs> yeah and they want their parents to approve of what they do this question come at my parents don't approve it so what <laughs> don't you know they don't approve if you really want to do it you're going to have to do it without their approval then it's going to be hard and maybe you'll come to some kind of an understanding later maybe you won't but like one can't be waiting for everybody to what has to do the things one wants to do and sometimes you know they were the wrong things for you but i think it's pretty okay like i think the fear of being wrong is very high for current generation because everything is scrutinized everything is given a meaning so that is tough i think it's tough in a way it wasn't for us and you only you can find the way out mm. read a poem mm. again yes to say i did mention this to you when we were talking what fran libovitz said about uh, because of some naomi or saka thing that happened when she said uh, you know in our time uh, parents used to prepare their children for the world but today parents are preparing the world for their children that's happening again and again and again that's very true you know mm-hmm. like the thing that you're wanting to walk into a world walk into a room walk into an office Right. you have to make it that way because actually the things that most of us want to do the world doesn't make it possible so we have to kind of make it for ourselves we have to co-create it right and you have to invest in building those new spaces for yourself if you don't do it and if you think that other people are going to do it then eventually those spaces will wither away then you won't have that space so one is i think either you can enrich other spaces that exist uh, i've seen many people do that like go and work in an organization and take ownership and change it and make it different or you make some new spaces but you have to do it a little bit like it's very systematic it's very hard work it's not easy to do it mm-hmm. and you do have to co-create it with others so like and you don't have to do it when you're 22 frankly speaking like i would say 22 it's better to like co-create with others but later on in life yeah. i need to make spaces for others like meta is a space for others right mm-hmm. and agents wish is a space for others and there are many spaces that others created that i was part of when i was young that made it possible for me to do this so i think remembering that kind of shrinkla that we are part of is very helpful ankit about having time for politics is it right to be political when you're a student sure why not um i was not very politically active as a student so i don't have anything i went for a few morchas and you know like young people did that but so i don't think i have like a lot of advice but i did get involved with other things in which i neglected my studies and got too obsessed with and whatever and yeah then you would like get bad marks and then you feel a little chastised and you try to balance it i guess so i don't know i i, mean, I can't answer this question very properly i don't have the right set of experiences what second my zoom has suddenly disappeared um when did you start living alone to be answered there is a question from a person who is here franny franny wanted to ask a question she messaged me and said is it okay if i ask a question Hello. <laughs> Rani, you... I'm here. Hi, ma'am. You Hi. don't want to show us your face? No, because I'm cleaning my room. <laughs> it looks so pretty. Okay. But uh, I was, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I interned with you two years ago. Remember, Nikita. Uh... <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't forget anybody. Yeah. <laughs> And I remember that at the end of that internship, I realized that i was a very lazy person and i also realized that the work that that i thought was enough was definitely not enough and um, i continue feeling that even today because i sit right next to vijayta ma'am so every day i feel very like i'm not doing anything sitting next to her oh. uh, and and but i i remember feeling that you like we used to have a lot of meetings at asian sufish and you looked at all of our work very yeah, carefully no more. i don't do all that now but yeah <laughs> but uh, 
I remember once um, my friend Naranjana had worked on something and she got scoldings from you and I switched off my camera and I was laughing my ass off. And the very next day I got scoldings from you. So, <laughs> so um, all <laughs> happened and I remember the amount of time you spent looking at our work or even though I was just an intern, I was there for one or two months and uh, I would go away at the end of that. But there was a lot of work that a lot of time and energy you spent on me and um, all of this was also happening when I was seeing a lot of conversation on the internet about how journalism internships don't pay enough mm. blah 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 uh, they, we need to be uh, paid more but I kept thinking you know for all the work you were doing for me and looking at my writing and my art I should be paying you uh, because <laughs> but I have been thinking about this for the longest while now the kind of to sit with someone and look at their work like that because at my job now I often find myself sitting with students and reading their work mm. and uh, sometimes it feels like it it's it's a lot of energy to go through like five six seven students every day and I wanted to ask you uh, it might be a very stupid que- question but I wanted to know why you why do you do that for us the why do you why did I do it? Well, I think that, you know, I don't have a real answer for it, but I feel like everything is uh, worth making beautiful, but as beautiful as you can make it. And I believe that especially women, uh, queer people, um, maybe everybody, but especially women and queer people, we don't easily get asked to accept. I mean, if you can speak English and you look a bit nice and, you know, you're a bit efficient you'll do okay so there is not nobody demanding that you be excellent because nobody demands that you be excellent it doesn't always occur to you so I think that I it's yeah it matters to me a lot that things should be excellent and beautiful and so I really do it for that reason and yeah I feel it's something that you give it's like a thing that you give back to young people who come in and Maybe it's like trying to do for others, which you, I didn't have that much of when I was growing up, um, et cetera. So yeah, that is actually why I did it. Like when we started Agents of Fish, I did decide that when interns come, that's something I'll do, that each intern will do one piece of work that I will mentor from beginning to end. Um, I think people should do those things for each other. Uh, I mean, my friends have done things for me. My friends have read my drafts. They have listened to me moaning and groaning. Uh, everybody's going to hate it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that um, it's, I, I, I wish for people to do it for each other. Let me say that I hope that when it happens, and if you think it's a nice thing that happened for you, at that moment, I know that nobody feels it. They feel care. But if you feel overall that it was something that you valued, then I hope that you'll do it for other people. Actually, yeah, this might be the most idealistic part of me. Otherwise, I'm not such a sweet character as you know <laughs> I think that these acts they cannot be measured in money hmm. it's a reverse version of what I said earlier that people value themselves only in money so then hmm. what else about you do you value but I don't want to value you only in money if I have money I'll pay you obviously but I want to value you I want to help us find together the thing about you that you can value hmm. and I'm a firm believer or I would say a firm non-believer in the idea that you have to love yourself first before somebody loves you. I don't think so. I think you do learn to love yourself when others love you. So if somebody pays attention to you, mm-hmm. to your work, and helps you to get someplace, then that makes you feel, yes, maybe it's I can do it. You need that. Everybody needs it. So I feel, but I have to say that now I don't do it. And that now we pay interest because... <laughs> all right, if that's how you look at yourself. <laughs> you wanted it, you got it and all. I would say that you know in corporates again interns should probably get paid because they don't get so many learning opportunities they just kind of there Um, so I think it's different you can't apply the same yardstick to everything but the amount of effort that is put into teaching young people when they come into a space like Agents of Ishq I mean Agents of Ishq or Parodevi Pictures in general has trained so many people and I'm proud to say that they're all doing pretty well in their life now right even if some of them might be hating me but they are doing well they learned well some of them fought with me and then later on have told me that you know now now I really value like I mean I was very moved when recently I went to an event that an older assistant of mine was at 
and i was excited you know when they came out and they were clapped and everything and then she came and she told me mujhe itni tareefein milti hain yahan par but wo sari tareefein is because of you like i get praised such a lot for my work but i learned it from you so i feel proud when that happens i feel happy i feel happy that i did that and i and yeah i'm not i mean i'm not ashamed to say that i think i have done that for a lot of people we should we should all do it for each other right so otherwise the world cannot change so um yeah i think it's a pity if people have limit started limiting themselves so much uh you have no choice but to uh, respect it because they really people really see that as a sign that they are respected mm-hmm. that you are respected okay i mean maybe we'll never love each other and maybe that's absolutely okay mm-hmm. but it's very nice to love each other <laughs> so you know thank There's you there's a lot of networks right like you get a lot of networks i got exposed to a lot of people and i built friendships and i made networks because of the places i worked in though i didn't earn much money and of course for the rest of your lives you'll be asking us to write references with two days deadline so <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah teachers know what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah oh my god hmm. i uh, had this image to share with you i mean you said uh, Dipanita, what are my plans for Valentine's Day? I don't know. I'll be sitting in my door hoping to get roses from you all. Dipanita is asking a question. I can't see it. What are your plans for Valentine's Day? There are. <laughs> like nothing. I can't see any questions. Is are you still on? I mean, are you able to see it? On Zoom, I'm seeing them. Yeah. It's in the chat box, ma'am. Somebody is placing. Everything is disappeared. Something is happening. I don't know what. Okay, never mind. But yeah. I uh, had one. Wait, are there any more questions? Because I can't see anything. Oh no! There was one about uh, were there any spots or places in Mumbai where you could go for moments of peace? Yeah, uh, yeah. There was actually, but it's not there anymore. There was a place called Sea View Cafe. It was on Juhu Beach. It was a veranda, and it had these little like cottage like rooms, and it was in the flight path of the runway. So they were not allowed to build over it. And it was owned by a man called Mr. Goregaonkar. He had a big dog, so the dog would be there. Mr. Goregaonkar was there. and the food was pretty bad uh but there was beer and there was the beach there was juhu beach you just sat there you saw all the people so i spent many 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 evenings there i met my friends there i went and wrote over there some sundays i just went there with my newspaper and ate brunch so i really really miss it a lot yeah mm, ma'am i might have a question if this time there is there is some. wait wait paru do you do do you mind sure no problem yeah Okay, I I mean I don't know if this is a long question or a short one, but um one thing I've always been... oh, my answers are long, you know that right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to take too much of your time. That's why. Um, so one thing that I've always been very curious about is um, um, some kind of I I don't want to use the word academic because academic, but you also said that after your BA you didn't go into academia because you wanted to do a lot of other things. but um what i really enjoy about your columns or generally all of the things you write um the language is not particularly academic but you are saying things which seem to be coming from similar such spaces so i was just curious uh, about your reading life and 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 what you think of see this large thing called academia and if you have something to say about that I mean, um, I would say that I have a lot of friends who are academics. I have learned a lot from them, and I'm not one of those people who dismisses academia. I may dismiss the uh, power structures. I may dismiss some of the kind of uh, canonical ideas, the kind of elitism, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We all know many of the problems of academia, um, but I think that you know, at heart, it's a space where ideally people will go and think brilliant thoughts, and uh, we will all have our minds blown open by those thoughts i have had it right and i have a lot of academic friends who have also helped me to articulate my ideas better or who have given me the validation like when i have said like like my friend rahul one day like oh, you know i want to make this film on toilets and then i want to talk about this and that and he'd be like yes yes so and so has written such and such book and you're like okay so my idea is not totally random so these conversations i think that also it's possible for us see i don't believe in the real estate approach i call it the real estate approach to valuing things mm-hmm. that if you live in marine drive then your house is valuable but if you live in andhra east you are not valuable mm-hmm. i am not a believer in that and i like find it ridiculous <laughs> uh, that people like i find it really like 
funny. I don't even feel embarrassed for the people. I just feel like, are you like, are you for real? Uh, so, but the thing is that just because you're in academia doesn't mean that you'll be smart. Like I recently, at, oh God, I recently attended some event and everybody was saying excessively foolish things. Like I felt like now, any minute now, the word self-care will come and it came also. So <laughs> what is the point of studying so much then? But the thing is that, um, I mean, you see this big, can you see all the books? That are, can you see the book, big pile of books here? No. The butterfly lab. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, I can see the books. Yeah. So all of them are academic books given to me by various academics who've written them. I've not read all of them. But I think that, yeah, I mean, I read a lot. So I read, I don't read all academic books, but I read them if I think they're about something that interests me. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, yeah, it's great. It's awesome. And I think that uh, what can happen is that you can talk about ideas anywhere. I write a 550 word column in a tablet. And you're, who would think that a tabloid will publish the kind of column I write? Uh, the positions, the language, the articulation, the thinking in it. I, I have been writing that column for almost 14 years. I didn't think when I started it, there would be a readership for it, but there is. So I think like, I don't believe that one should think in such a hidebound fashion, especially about form. And I think like this idea of queering form in that, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to use it because that's such an academic term and it has a, almost a fixed and unqueered meaning. But actually that idea, you know, of not being in the place you're supposed to be. The thing can be anywhere. Mm. You have to learn to recognize it when you see it, right? And Hindi film songs are full of all this wisdom, right? Like, it's like, I'll know you. I'll know you when I see you. So I'll know the idea when I see it. Otherwise, what am I doing? I only know it because you've told me that that's important, right? If it's a man who said it, then it matters. If it's a woman who said it, then it's... If women like romances, they're lesser. If men like Star Wars, like somehow, somehow cute. I don't know. I only seen one or two Star Wars movies, so I don't know what the deal is. But <laughs> that, that ability to say, to give political value, to mm. give value to the thing, right? Like if people laugh at me for loving Shah Rukh Khan, yeah. I'm not, I mean, like, it's fine. I yeah. feel by loving Shah Rukh Khan, I opened up an entire, a uh, lot of people's careers. <laughs> it's okay. Like, you know, people, yes. like, it's a thing. People can talk about Shah Rukh Khan now in a way that they didn't before. So actually new things become possible only when you step out of that kind of a framework. So yeah, in short, I think academia, some academics are cool, some are bores. Okay. The ones who like me are the best, obviously, right? <laughs> the ones who write about me are even better. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, that's my mm -hmm. short Okay, thank you. I mean, I appreciate intelligence. Let me just say that. Oh, okay, it's good to know. Thank you. I can't begin to explain what has happened in the last <laughs> one and a half hours because... Uh, I can tell you, I was just talking non-stop. So that's a little embarrassing. I'll give you one image though that uh, put everything in place for me. Uh, no, actually two images. One is your image of... Uh, I see a young girl coming to a city and then doing things, decorating a house. Um, and she had no idea that in a couple of years, she would be changing many lives across the country. Uh, no, I don't know about that, but okay. It's very big to say, but I really do want you to know because just this morning, a student asked me, ma'am, you're very public with your love for Paranita Vora. Aren't you afraid? Uh, what? Of love, of showing love, so much love. And that made me think. Mm. I wondered whether there was any truth to asking this question because it came from a very good place. Because it was like, how are you unafraid to show so much love? And I thought about it. Mm. Uh, and really, maybe in my 20s, I was just as unafraid. But then midway, I became like, okay, now let me keep all the love in my heart and not show anybody else. At 35, maybe you will be more afraid to show love to people. Uh, but I think you're one of the very few women in my life I have I, I I love and I don't mind publicly screaming on top of mountains how much I love you because uh, your work does that. Your life does that. Uh, I will never hesitate to love you. Thank you so much. And what I want to say, I mean, to you, of course, but also to the student, right? Like it matters such a lot when people show you love. Actually, you change. It also changes my life, right? Like when people show me love because... It's all that I've got to say that what I do is valuable because in a kind of very conventional sense, I don't have that 
kind of, today I got an email from someone saying that there's an inquiry, speaking inquiry for you from I am Ahmedabad. We would like to let you know it's a pro bono speaking engagement. And I want to say, I would like you to know that, fuck you. But <laughs> I just, but you know, I mean, I'm feeling like, wow, why is this still happening to me? So there is a sense in which in the conventional world, I always have to remind myself that it's not going to value me. Uh, it's going to value me like, oh, wow, she's cool. Oh, wow, she's interesting, whatever. But there's a kind of fear. No, no, you're not the girl that, I'm not the girl that people want to marry in a sense. So it's very important to me when people show me love because it reminds me of my value. So uh, please show me some love. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. And everything about today's conversation uh, is also so much about how you answered Fanny's question about why did you do that for us? It's so much of what many people do for others, but it just doesn't, it's not noticed uh, very often. Uh, to give you an image uh, of, you know, there's this fear of people who work hard, fear of them because everyone wants to think that they're stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, like I have Dr. Alumani who works here, he's the dean, is pretty much married to the department. He's here all the time. And uh, many people think he's stupid because he does so much work and he does so much for students. Um, I've often seen him talking to students for like five hours or two hours or half an hour. Mm -hmm. And in that half an hour, he would have gotten to know so much about the student. And uh, our, my perspective and other people's perspective of the student would have changed. It'll be like one really troublesome student who will irritate all the teachers in the class. And mm -hmm. then we'll yell at him and be like, go away or whatever. And we'll send him, go talk to sir. And sir will sit with the student for about half an hour and ask him simple questions like, where are you from? Who's there in your family? What does your father do? What does your mother do? What do you do? And I don't know how, but in that whatever time, the student feels changed because someone has asked him these questions. And their behavior with us in the classroom also changes. And that's really time that someone else has taken to ask these simple questions, which is what you did to Fanny when you took time, which is what you always do to your people who come and work for you. And it's amazing how much the time that people give to work that goes unnoticed, like you correctly pointed out, that can't be paid in money or returned in money. Uh, and I'm glad that there are people like you who value work who make it possible for young people and also other people to come and be like that. And that's fascinating. Thank you. I mean, I don't have as nice as uh, our own money because I don't think I saw patient. Once upon a time, I was a bit like that, but <laughs> I was a little bit hardened and feel annoyed. I mean, I, I would say there's some wear and tear on me personally. I'm being honest because sometimes I feel like people all the time want you to do something for them. And there's a, you feel, sometimes you feel angry and disrespected by the fact that people just want something without engaging right with you that's how the world has become so they don't intend it badly so I do feel teachers are exceptional because all the teachers that I know who are my friends there's a lot of kindness towards young people in them I think I'm a lot more impatient but I think teachers are much kinder in the way that you've just described and I, I do regret that I have lost some of those qualities and I also accept that I probably may not be getting them back but it is still kindness if you're if you love your work or if, yeah. you, if you take time to look at other people's work, right? And that that's so rare. I hope it's received in that way. It's not always. <laughs> I mean, I think that's why it, it's, it's an act of great love, seriousness and commitment that teachers keep on doing it every single day. And I would say that I'm definitely lesser than that because I do become sometimes like, okay, whatever, like, fine. Now I'm not, I'm not going to kill myself. Like sometimes I hear myself saying that. And, and I do think that students are much more vulnerable uh, that it is life-changing to I mean it was life-changing for me to have great college teachers so uh, you know in a sense workspaces are slightly different and have different dynamics so we we do have to learn different boundaries and different ways of being and different ways of conserving ourselves but I think uh, I'm just thinking as you spoke that you know it's a defense against capitalism's desire to tell us that we don't matter uh, so in some ways we do have to try to hold on to that part of ourselves. Like it's something I have to remind myself after this, this conversation has made me feel like I should remind myself that I have to find a way to be that way. Uh, if this way is hard, then I have to find another way to be so that I can still retain some of those older qualities, which now, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for that. 
are there any questions? I don't think so. No, nothing else. Yeah. Paro, thank you for changing my life. I can't say this enough. But Ayla, thank uh, you very much for having me here. I mean, yeah. Uh, Matt, like St. Joseph's is one of those places where I feel like Shah Rukh Khan. So <laughs> uh, there are lots of people who are confused. Like, you know, they always tell me that, don't you want to meet Shah Rukh Khan? And I'm always like, no, because I am Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, the idea of wanting to be like that. And thank you for St. Joseph's to make, for making me feel like I can dream that dream. And some days it's true. I did. Uh, I went around telling everybody uh, last year because they saw my Instagram in your house and they were like, you got to meet your Shah Rukh Khan. And I said, <laughs> um, it's one of my fondest memories uh, coming to your house and talking to you and all. And I wish that more young people see you that way. Come back soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening for so long. Yeah.